You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. Today we're discussing the 11th Doctor Big Finish audio story, The Calendar Man. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? And Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, remember to like The Secrets of Doctor Who on Facebook, where we're at facebook.com slash secrets of Doctor Who. Retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN, and be sure to leave comments where you find us. We'd love to hear from you. Another show on the StarQuest Network that I'm sure you're going to enjoy is called The Secrets of Middle-Earth. You can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Middle-Earth. So today we're discussing The Calendar Man. This is a big finish uh, story featuring the 11th Doctor uh, from uh, what is it? the 11th Doctor Chronicles is the series in Big Finish. And Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens in this story? This week, the 11th Doctor and Amy Pond get a distress call from a woman named Olivia. She's from an Earth colony world in the future where people are dying, and then everyone forgets that they even existed, kind of like the Mandela effect. Only Olivia remembers them and writes down their stories. Upon investigating, the Doctor, Amy, and Olivia discover that the deaths are being caused by the Calendar Man, and this is not the Calendar Man who is the Batman villain. Instead, it's a figure from Time Lord folklore who judges whether people have lived well or ill. And if he determines that they've lived ill, he deletes them from history, timey-wimey, and writes them into his own book of forgotten truths, where they sign their names. He's been killing guilty people from the Earth colony, but their lives are insubstantial and don't really satisfy him. The Doctor, who has a Time Lord life, would satisfy him, and he offers to stop killing the colonists if the Doctor will submit to his judgment. The Doctor goes along with this to save the colonists, but when the time comes, he refuses to sign his real name and announces that Olivia has signed his name in the Calendar Man's book in his place. And this is a problem for the Calendar Man because Olivia is an innocent woman, and if he kills an innocent woman, he will die. The Calendar Man thus chooses to spare her, writes his own history in his book, and passes out of existence. And all the colonists get their memories back of the people they have lost. Afterwards, the Doctor places the Calendar Man's book in the TARDIS library. The end. All right. Uh, yeah, so this is a... May 2018 uh, mm -hmm. story this came out somewhere around then or recorded then I think is what I saw mm -hmm. um, and this is audiobook style single narrator and uh, who does some variations of voices and does a pretty decent Matt Smith yeah mm -hmm. he so J Jacob Dudman is the narrator and he voices the doctor and most of the other characters um, Olivia is played by a woman named Eleanor Crooks but everybody else is played by Jacob Dudman. And that he does Matt Smith very well. Mm -hmm. But um he's his 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 Amelia Pond Scottish accent is not cutting it. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> he's got the wrong Scottish accent. The accent that Jacob Dudman is using is much more towards the back of his mouth. And mm -hmm. Amelia Pond's Scottish accent is much more towards the front of her mouth. And so it just sounds wrong. And it ke yeah. I keep having this, who is this Scotsman idea? Um, <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, it's supposed to be, a, it's supposed to be Amy. Yeah. Yeah. It was weird to, yeah, to ha to, it was, it didn't fit. Right. I mean, there are, yeah, like you said, there are variations on Scottish accents and he got the wrong one. Um, apparently he does other uh, doctors as well. I think he's done mm -hmm. 10th doctor ones and some he, others. He did the 11th doctor in that one uh, last 11th doctor story we did, Regeneration Impossible. That's right. 11th That's and right. 12th, both, yeah. Yep. So I should ask you what your overall impressions are. Uh, uh, Father Corey, what, what was your overall impression of this one? You know, in, in general, I've, I've liked the big finish we've listened to. This one was just kind of meh for me. And maybe part of it was just because of the, 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 the voice acting. And it, it was just kind of an okay story. I really wasn't the biggest fan of it. It just was okay. I, I mean, I, I think that's about the only thing I can say about it. Okay. And Jimmy, <laughs> for you? Yeah, I'd say it's a kind of middle-of-the-road story. Sometimes Big Finish is absolutely brilliant. Like, Live 34 is mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the Chimes at Midnight is amazing. But yeah. then you have... None of them are really terrible. Well, except for that 
one Doctor Who Unbound where the doctor was a woman who was a refugee from Absolutely Fabulous. <laughs> right, right, right. But almost always, they're, they're at least okay. And I would say this is an okay story. Um, I like that the Calendar Man is, has this timey-wimey aspect. He's a bogeyman who will remove you from history, and that's Time Lordy. But um, a lot of what happens, especially at the end of the plot, even though I summarized it, it seems unmotivated to me. Mm -hmm. Like, why does the calendar man not just kill Olivia? Why does he decide to spare her if he's mm -hmm. a villain? Yeah. If he's going to die anyway, he may as well take someone with him. Yeah. Right, right. There was a couple, yeah, a couple of holes in the characterization there. Um, for me, it was interesting, actually, because uh, I was listening to this at the same time I was reading this new Star Trek novel, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, The High Country, which deals with sort of colonists under under difficult circumstances. So it was kind of interesting to compare them. Uh, but this one, I agree with both of you. It was it was OK. The premise was interesting. The execution, not as good. Uh, but. I think it's kind of interesting that it deals with these themes of confession and guilt uh, because so many of the people that are killed in this colony are people who have committed offenses or sins. Mm -hmm. not, Serious ones. Yes. Yeah. And, and what the calendar man is doing is eliciting from them their confession, their, their, their profession of their guilt and their remorse in, in many cases. And I thought that was an interesting aspect to deal with was this idea of confession and guilt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of funny. The calendar man knows what's written on our hearts and he's sort of a twisted version of the Holy spirit in, in, in that sense. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a twisted Santa too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, One thing, another hole I thought was his name, the Calendar Man, because apparently he's not following a Time Lord calendar. He's following whatever the local calendar is. And this Earth colony, even though it's on another planet, is using the 365-day calendar from Earth, right. which is okay. Um, that's not a problem. But um, he, um, he's... The thing that gives the doctor the clue is there have been 30 people killed and there are 335 colonists left. Mm. And the doctor puts those numbers together and goes, 365, this must be the calendar man. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. How did you know there were going to be 365 total colonists? Mm. Why would they send exactly that number and not 400 or 300 or 378? I mean, yeah. They didn't establish any rule that the colony has to have one colonist per day of the Earth calendar. Yeah, that was a, kind of odd. Father Corey? Well, and it, it, one thing that kind of struck me, too, is this kind of felt like a redressing of the, weep, the Weeping Angels, the original idea of the Weeping Angels, where they would send, the Weeping Angels would feed by sending you back in time and basically feed on your time energy that you would have had going forward the rest of your life. You'd still live the rest of your life just back in time. And it kind of felt like this was a redressing of that, where instead of taking you back in time, he would eat the rest of your time. He would kill you, and, and that's what he would eat off of. Not yeah. just your sins, but also the time that you would have had if he hadn't intervened. And so it, it just it kind of felt like a redressing of that. And then, again, it was just kind of different. Yeah, that was, yeah. It, it, I mean, there was some interesting aspects of it because having a Time Lord boogeyman is an interesting idea. The guy, you know, that how, what would what would Time Lord culture that what we know of it, what kind of boogeyman would you create? What kind of mythological creature would there be? And one that has to do with judging your actions over time, especially over regenerations. That would that would be an interesting aspect of Time Lord culture. It's interesting in keeping with the. Stephen Moffat science fairy tale version mm -hmm. of Doctor Who, we got a lot of Time Lord folklore and children's stories during the Matt Smith run, like the right. Pandorica, and in the next to last episode of Amy and Rory, The Power of Three, we got uh, that Time Lord, other Time Lord mythology bogeyman. So the authors at Big Finish seem to be picking up on something Stephen Moffat was doing during this era of the program. That's that true. even kind of went to uh, um, 
Russell T Davies, where he had, you know, the, we had the giant spider thing in the middle of the earth that came from the dark times, you know, way back before time Lord civilization and stuff like that. The Ragnos. Yeah. The Ragnos. Yeah. There were, there were quite a few of those too, as well. Those things that, oh yeah, this goes way back to before, you know, recorded history type stories. Mm. And that goes back to the fourth doctor with the Mm. vampires and so forth. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That Adric will totally betray you to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Adric would betray you to a piece of toast. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Especially if there's avocado on it. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I said that. But uh, the, um, the, so then we have this other character, Olivia, that we get introduced to. And for some reason, she's the only one who remembers. And that's because she sits with these people as they're dying. And records their story, records their their sins, their confessions, um, and so I wasn't quite sure why doesn't the calendar man's affect affect her. They explain this, um, but it goes by kind of subtly. Thirty days ago, a fog descended on this colony, and they eventually establish that there are two people who are immune to the effects of the fog who do remember everybody who has been deleted um one of them is captain um where is it captain martina medina medina yeah um anyway she's she was the captain captain medina and she was the captain of the colony ship who has been put in prison because um there was a coup against her and so she is out of the fog, and that's why she remembers it. The doctor says there's probably a memory affecting agent in the fog. And Olivia remembers them because she's writing down their stories. So that reinforces her memories. But it doesn't seem to. This is another thing that I think is a flaw in the writing. Um, it's, it is not at all clear that the calendar man is really deleting people from history which is what mm-hmm. you would expect from a Time mm-hmm. Lord boogeyman. They, all trace of the person should vanish, and it doesn't. They right. still have houses, and other people scratch the names off of the p- houses of the people who have disappeared. And so it's more of a memory. I'm, he's, he's removing memories right. of the person. He's not really removing them from history. Right. Mm. Yeah, they go, they go through the different houses and get the journals from each person mm-hmm. who was deleted who was killed by this calendar man and are able to read their stories of what they did. Right. So yeah, they're they're not being erased from history, but they are being killed. And then people are, are forgetting about them. And and they show that where after the one, the one guy dies in the hospital and then all of a sudden, you know, the person forgets, you know, within a few minutes of that, this person even existed. His wife, I think it was his sister gets it. Sister. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, on some level, they do seem to remember them even after they forget, like, like the people will be emotional, mm-hmm. even though they don't know why they're being emotional. And so there's at some subconscious levels, even still that they remember the, the people. So it's not even a complete wipe of the memory either. Um, so yeah, kind of a inconsistent, not complete sort of thing. Yeah. This is a very atmospheric story rather than a very tightly plotted story to my sure. mind. Yeah. Absolutely. It was, an interesting detail that uh, all of the colonists were keeping journals for historical purposes. I thought that was mm-hmm. an interesting, you know, when you're going to found a, a colony, you want a history. And so the, the first people there will be required to keep journals of what's going on. So that for historical purposes of this new civilization that you've created. I thought that was a nice little detail. Yep. Um, also that all of the, uh, the buildings, the first buildings, are constructed from the colony ship itself. When the, the ship arrives, it's dismantled and it's designed to be like Lego blocks or something dismantled mm-hmm. and rebuilt as the first buildings of the new city. That's also, a, 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 I kind of like that as a nice little detail as well. That was kind of interesting. I like the jail where they have Captain Medina is, they say it's just a big like rectangle mirror. Mm. Mm. So it's like a, bo- a shoe box, giant shoe box with, with mirrors on the outside. Right. Hmm. Right. Yeah. I was going to say with, with the, the, how they set up the colony that that's, of course, that's kind of the, the, the prevailing theory of how to, how to do that, that when you get to the planet, you land the ship on the planet and then you just strip it for parts. You strip it for, 
equipment, you strip it for the the rooms, and that mm-hmm. that ship it, it's one way travel. Right, you know, you're not going back. So right, may as well use use everything you've got, every resource you have at your disposal. And it's even designed to unfold and Mm -hmm. become these other buildings. So it's like folded in on itself for travel and then it's unfolded to become an outpost. Yes. Um, So, and then, yeah, even like the, uh, the cabins of the officers are all like become their cat, literal cabins Mm -hmm. or cottages. Uh, Yeah. So uh, most of the people who disappeared are officers. And I think because they were all the ones involved in the mutiny against Medina. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, and so the, the, the first officer led the mutiny. I don't remember if they actually told us why they mutinied uh, against Medina. Yeah, I, I was listening for that and I think they may have, but it went by really fast if they did, because mm. I don't remember a clear reason why. Yeah, they, they didn't, I don't think they really said they did and it. And it made the impression it just looking at the, the, the TARDIS wiki that she was, the, the captain was completely innocent in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. but the first officer is the one who uh, kind of stirred everyone up against her for whatever reason. And it turns out that first officer, Alan Seagraf is Olivia's father, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, which is why I think she's so uh, on the case. Um, but she says she didn't get his testimony before his death. So then how does she remember him? <laughs> if the test, if if her writing it down was how she remembered people, I thought that might have been a little plot hole. I don't know, but um, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, well, and, and why is she the one who hears the ticking when no one else does? Right, the ticking, the cal- thats the evidence of the calendar man at work, or you know, right. take, about to take a life. Because she says that she could hear the ticking and can follow it, so that she's there at the moment the person dies. Yeah, yeah kind of interesting yeah, something about her makes her the key figure in all of this Maybe and because in, she's the innocent one she's the only one who wasn't involved that which that's kind of implausible that she was the only one who didn't mutiny right she's, she's the uh she's the only innocent one the only sinless one she's mary uh yeah <laughs> so um the we have this they, they go on this search for sigrath's diary his journal and they find his secret diary and that's where they see his confession before his death. And they also find, um, what, I forget what the other guy who did die that they, that they met uh, when he died. Marcus Haddon. Marcus, yep. all right. They find his uh, journal, his diary, where he confesses to have stolen, stolen his sister uh, Martina's money from the, her safe. You know, and that's, that was his sin that he was guilty of so so they and they go around they find these journals where everyone's sins are confessed um so uh there at one point we i think it's the doctor who says whatever it ki- this is when the calendar man it kills not just the body but what keeps us alive after death others memories of us and that's that's supposed to be i guess the horror of this is you know when we die we want to be remembered and right. to be forgotten after your death is in, in in this story the worst possible fate, I guess. You know, to well, be forgotten. It's standard secular mm-hmm. immortality nonsense. Right. It's like, right. look, dude, no one's going to remember you in a thousand years anyway. <laughs> Heck, you're lucky well, if anyone remembers wanna, you in two generations. <laughs> yeah, I want to be conscious in the afterlife. That's what I want. Right. Yeah. Well, it was. It was. It's like. Uh, the most recent episode or season of Star Trek Picard, we talked about that where Data was, he's the sum of his memories. That's mm-hmm. who Data is. That's how he can be human, you know, or be, you know, yeah. conscious, that's, how you want to put it. Right, right. And that's, yeah, that is clearly not, you know, there is something about us that lives beyond death that is uh, permanent and immortal. I, I think it's interesting how Olivia, so the doctor is guilty, you know, that he's judged and judged to be guilty. This is a, a theme we saw multiple times, uh, you know, the doctor or, um, he's uh, got the, the time war behind him and everything now. Right. Mm-hmm. And so he's judge guilty, but refuses to write his true name in the, in the calendar man's book. And so Olivia becomes a sort of substitutive sacrifice in a sense. I mean, there's that, that interesting, I will, you know, you're guilty. I'm innocent and I will substitute for you in the sacrifice and thereby, mm-hmm. um, you know, save you. So the, it's an interesting salvific or, you know, um, soteria, soteriology 
mm-hmm. going on here. I, I don't want to go too deep on that, obviously, but uh, I thought that was an interesting aspect of it anyway, that it, it hits on a truth of It also reality. is... Un, is unmotivated because mm-hmm. um, the, they try to set it up when the doctor tells her to pick a pen name that fits and keep writing. Mm-hmm. Right. And in hindsight, she interprets that as an instruction to sign the book using a pen name in the doctor's place. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. That's not <laughs> what that means. Yeah. Right. That means pick a pen name that suits you and keep writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, and so as you mentioned, Jimmy, in the recap, the, the, the calendar man ends up writing his own story into the book. Um, and at the end, as the doctor puts the calendar man's book in his own library in the TARDIS, he hears the ticking. So is the calendar man dead? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> calendar man's still in there, but yeah. he's written into his own book instead of history, supposedly. Okay. Yep. So. So we could see him again. Apparently, that's the that there's no one ever dies, and so every villain is can come back. Any uh, other things I might have missed, or anything last things to say about this episode, Father Corey? Nothing here, Jimmy. Oh, um, the doctor gives Livy, Olivia a companion offer, and mm. she she turns him down at the end of the story. She turns him down for now, but hints that she may be back in the future. Although thus far, it's been five years, and she hasn't. Right. Right. That's true. All right. So uh, I think that does it for this time. Uh, We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including Roger and Julie J, Joshua P, Matthew D, Father Joseph S, and Petru. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edited this episode. So that's it from us. What did you think of The Calendar Man? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com, The Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page, or send an email to Who at sqpn.com, or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. You can watch The Secrets of Doctor Who on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia, where you can leave comments. And also, I encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell to get notifications of new episodes. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Three Doctors episode uh, from the Third Doctor's Time. Until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thanks, Tom. Father Corey Stika, thank you as well. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Methanelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember... We're going to help her. It's what we do.